of the Institute have put together. What we look at is a, a number of different ap approaches to see where we should be focusing as an organization. So th this one is particularly about forest quality. This, this, and this shows that a high score indicates forest with large carbon stores, high integrity, and a significant contr contribution to the persistence of bi di biodiversity. And what we see is a, a strip across the Amazon, across the, Krong across the Congo Basin, and a, an, an important component in, a, in, 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 in Borneo and uh, uh, Papua New Guinea. Next uh, slide, please. Then we can look at woody biomass carbon. This is very similar as well. Um, um, here, here what we see is that the, de the density of above ground and below, below ground carbon, which has been from, transformed into a percentile rank. And again, you're seeing the same sorts of areas really flashing up in and around the Congo Basin, Borneo and, and the Amazon, Air, Amazon Basin. Next slide, please. Then we look at the biodiversity. Again, this is the other component, and I think an area that uh, the audience here will be very is, is particularly interested in. And we see the high spots where the where the, we have the sites significantly contributing to the global uh, persistence of biodiversity. And again, we're looking at Borneo, we're looking at areas in Southeast Asia, the Congo Basin, Western Africa, and uh, and uh, the Amazon area. Next slide, please. And then when we contrast against that, against the threat of development, what does development mean? This means the, these are the areas where they're coming under threat, a significant threat of, of land use change. Uh, and these can be for a number of different areas. In, in Borneo, we know that this is inherent about uh, palm oiling, for example. Um, in Congo, in that area, it's, it tends to be more for logging. Whereas uh, in, in the Amazon, it, can, it tends to be for <clears throat> agriculture use for mining uh, and also for logging itself. Next slide, please. Now, what the Woodwell have done is they brought all of these indicator, indicators together in a composite, uh, which is called the Keystone Forest of Planetary Health. And these green and these these percentile ranks are the the, the highest, the, the brightest green is exactly where the main focus is uh, that, that should be for us in our mission to to reduce um, uh, deforestation and the and the impact uh, on both co on uh, planet on uh, forest as well as human health. Next slide, please. Now. We talk a lot. I've talked already about indigenous peoples and local communities. I'll, I'll, I'll shorten that to IPLCs from now on, but they all they have a very important part to play in this. Um, they, with globally, they hold over 300 million tons of carbon uh, within the within the areas that they that they live. So supporting IPLCs, it's a climate solution. Supporting them to protect a forest is essential to reducing the climate crisis and the impacts of disease, conflict and forced migration. And the majority of these are in Africa, Asia and South America. And what are these health impacts I talk about? They're heat waves, undernutrition, infectious diarrhea, vector borne diseases, as well as increased conflict and forced migration. These are things that I saw very frequently in my time with MSF. Next slide, please. So who are we? Who's Health and Harmony? Um, briefly, we're an international nonprofit dedicated to reversing global heating. We're based in the US. Uh, well, most of us are based in the US, although in reality we're kind of scattered all over the place. Um, but we've got programs in Borneo, Amazon, and Madagascar that I'm going to I'm going to talk about. Our work is founded founded on a concept called radical listening, which I'll also talk about. And essentially, our mission is is reversing deforestation. And to think that we can sustainably improve human health without focusing on the health of the forest and, and ecosystem, it's a logical fallacy that's generally carried by a lot of organisations. Uh, and this is that this is the thing that we're, this is the thinking, the paradigm shift in thinking that we're trying to change. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> so we recognise that supporting IPLCs is the best way to protect forests, drawing down carbon and preventing these environmentally driven diseases. How do we do that? We, while we radically listen, we invest in their holistic solutions. Um, these tend to these tend to address the intersectional protectors of forest biodiversity and human well-being far more effectively than outsiders. And communities tend to be better placed to naturally design a planetary health approach to addressing climate change and the nature crisis than outsiders. Again. Next slide, please. And this is where Health and Harmony comes in. The solution that we provide, is, it's, it's relatively simple. We basically push to restore the agency to the people who really do know how to protect their rainforests. We don't need to tell them that they need to protect their rainforests. They know this. They know the importance of the community they live in. They see on a day to day basis their environment and the, the essence of their living um, that they've grown up with that their ancestors have grown up with being uh, uh, being being reduced for various reasons under different pressures. 
And, and they are the experts at knowing how to live in balance with their rainforest ecosystems. So what do we do with radical listening? Which This starts by asking them how the rest of the world might support them in living, uh, uh, in, in, ba living in balance with their rainforest and as a thank you for, the gar for their guardianship of the rainforest. Now, what's radical about this is that we um, uh, is that we listen for hours and we uh, and we document the solutions, but we then invest precisely in their solutions. This is the radical component. So when once we once we partner with these with, with these uh, organize with, with with the communities, we end up in a scenario where we uh, we are able to create sustainable solutions um, that are much better placed and much more uh, comprehensive and interlinked with each other than than what we currently uh, that what's currently on the table. So how does this process go? Um, after doing the listening, <coughs> we support through in order to support the design of the solutions, we sign an agreement with the communities as a commitment from both sides to achieve these outcomes. We then try to match these solutions with the highest quality resources available. An example being discounted healthcare designed by the communities with increased ecosystem protection. It's important to note that this, this process is not static. It's iteratively changing through continuous feedback and accountability from and to the communities um, through radical listening. So things change and we meet and, and, and we are continually evaluated directly and our processes are evaluated by the communities. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to talk briefly upon what radical listening as well is, um, because this is kind of the the core of what we do, and it's mentioned quite a lot during our uh, during our presentation. So what is this? It's a it's listening to a group with true recognition that they are the experts. It's a process to find consensus solutions uh, rather than individualistic approaches, and it's really it really looks at to garner knowledge from the whole um, rather than key individuals. And as, as I mentioned before, the, the radical part of this is not the listening. Most organizations will listen to the communities. They'll they'll look for feedback on the work that they're doing, usually after they've already implemented. And at least in my experience in the past, it's been, you know, I, I'd create a nutrition program um, in an area where there was severe malnutrition, a lot of high prevalence of severe, severe malnutrition. But then I would uh, I, I would then struggle to understand why I'd have such a high default rate or a low uptake rate of services. And that's because we tend traditionally to create solutions out of the box that have worked in different settings and assume they're going to work based on old knowledge. And that's actually not true. Um, it, it doesn't work. And we've, we've been through this and we know it doesn't work. Um, so ensuring the community has that governance and agency in designing and implementing these solutions is absolutely key. And, and the reciprocity agreement, and this is a way of the world to say thank you, and it's a moral commitment to jointly achieve these objectives. Next, uh, next slide, please. Now, why, why is this approach important and different? Like many of us come from a background of top-down decision-making where efficiencies and approaches are very alien to indigenous concepts and are strongly founded on, founded on colonial experience and perspectives. These things are the, the importance of the group over uh, individual over the group, the importance of actually accomplishing the task rather than the relationship with both the people and the environment around you, the thinking that faster is better, short-term short short thinking, you know, results within two years is more important than results within within five years that are more sustainable. The idea that meetings, they, they, they tend to waste time talking in extensively to understand people's perspectives wastes time, and that competitiveness is good, and asking questions uh, reveals weakness and ignorance. This isn't. This is a. This, these are all components of, of Western um, cultural bias. So when we. So uh, uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. Why radical listening? So what what do we do? We we try to find key fulcrums of change. We really push to give agencies to the to agency to those communities. Really thinking about the high being the how being more important than the why. And the, the solutions that are, that, that are yielded tend to be more, effect, more effective and more implemented because they're based on, they're created by the communities and the communities own them. And they tend to be naturally much more efficient and effective than what we're doing uh, uh, conventionally. Next slide, please. So what, 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 what is our experience? Communities typically design solutions that often include access to healthcare, livelihoods training and educational improvements. 
And what's interesting is that they, the solutions that are always that are designed, they tend always to be systemly linked, system, systematically linked, and this is always emphasised implementation. For example, patients and um, patients have, uh, communities have designed uh, solutions that, whereby being able to pay for healthcare with seedlings for reforestation not only assures equity, but it also helps make um, the relationship between the humans and the eco ecosystem health visible for everybody, the community, and and beyond. It also is much more equitable because anyone can plant uh, can plant seedlings. Next slide, please. And this is how communities design the healthcare system. Like we all believe that healthcare is a human right, and no one should be denied their ability should be denied healthcare because they're in a, of an inability, inability to pay. But it's really important to the success of this because, for example, individuals can grow a lot of seedlings for nothing as insurance for emergencies. And then we, we also provide a higher kind of higher discount and a higher a higher importance on on specific types of uh, trees that are more important, such as ironwoods, which are especially higher higher up in the insurance system. Next slide, please. Another example of community design solutions is a chainsaw buyback program. Now, communities don't need to be told how how important the rainforest is. I've, I've mentioned this already, <clears throat> and they always look for alternative sources of income whenever that's possible. In Borneo, for example, one solution designed by the communities was a chainsaw buyback program, where to date over 200 chainsaws have been bought, purchased back from former loggers. In exchange, loggers and their families, families receive money, mentoring and business planning assistance. Um, what, what's the outcome? The forests are protected while former loggers are supported in a transition to more sustainable livelihoods, uh, and, and, and it's a win-win all round. Next slide, please. So, Based on the success of the first program in Borneo, we started to replicate our approach in uh, beside rainforest communities in the middle in the middle uh, little, middle lands of the Zingu Basin in the Brazilian Amazon and Manumbu Reserve in southeast Madagascar. Now, these are three very different contexts. In Indonesia, people cut down the rainforest to pay mainly for healthcare in an area where there's a strong draw of high income for palm oiling um, as a very lucrative source of income. In Madagascar, things tend to be driven by extreme poverty, where deforestation occurs to meet, meet really basic needs. And in Brazil, it's, it's a very different situation where indigenous and riverine populations are forced to leave their land in order to access health care. And once they leave the land, that leaves it at risk from loggers, farmers and miners to come in and to take over. So really, for them, it's a question of ensuring that they are able to stay and reside within the land that they that they wish to protect. This is why we we, we refer to them as, as guardians and, and, and protectors of the rainforest. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And this is just a. This is where we work based on the same uh, Woodwell high risk map that map that I uh, that I uh, presented earlier on. <coughs> Sorry, next slide, please. So, what kind of impact have we uh, have we have we had? So, one of the it's very important to us as Health and Harmony, um, and I think to planetary health in general. That we start developing a really strong evidence base to show the importance of interlinkages of these different systems, and as part of this, uh, Stanford, a Stanford lab, which is independent from us, published a study in the in, in PNAS, uh, which found that um, uh, the Gul Gulampulong National Park. Oh, 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 second, oops. Yeah, sorry. Uh, ne next slide, please. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, that outside is that was supposed to, yeah, yeah, this one, which looked at um, ten years ten year patient data at GPMP, which is one of the parks in uh, in in Borneo and West Kalimantan, um, using remotely sensed Earth observation data, uh, a control group of all Category Two uh, national parks within Indonesia, and also used an internal comparison of participating communities' healthcare usage and outcomes compared to non-participating communities. We also want to look at the uh, the dose response curve uh, between conservation and uh, and healthcare utilization to kind of test that co the causality of, between the two. Like, was that was the support for healthcare directly associated with a reduction in uh, in, in rainforest over this ten year period? I have a we I can, I'm happy to share the link to this uh, um, this paper uh, after the presentation. Next slide, please. 
And the results were impressive. What we saw was that there was a, a reduction from 7.8 to 1% of men over the age of 19 years old logging in the park over a 10 year period. The result of this was a 70% reduction in annual deforestation, which actually which, which translates economic in, in economic terms to $65.3 million in carbon emissions for a mere $5.2 million investment over this time period. But importantly for the health and harmony model, we also saw a clear dose, a clear dose response link between the percent change in deforestation and the level, enga level of engagement with the health and harmony services. Okay, so I think you're on the next slide. Yeah. So not only did it have an impact on forest health, but once we controlled the, dis the distance effect and clinic usage, health visits were much higher in villages with re reciprocity agreements. The health outcomes were also impressive with a lower prevalence of disease in most, most villages with reciprocity agreements. Um, there were exceptions, uh, leprosy, for example, the rates tended to be higher in the in the health and harmony associated villages. But we think this is probably more likely down to be an increased um, diagnosis rate because in areas where with a limited amount of access to health care, diagnosis of these conditions was, 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 was probably quite a, a quite quite low. Next slide, please. So, of course, we need a, a nice cute picture of a, a lemur. Um, and this, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our, the Manumbu rainforest in Madagascar now. So the impact of health and harmony so far, we've 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 reforested now over 12 um, uh, 12 hectares of land, over 7,000 patient visits, uh, nine seedling nurseries have been built with a capacity of nearly 50,000 seedlings. We also have been really strongly working on agricultural training. One of the biggest challenges that that's faced by the community is nutrition and undernutrition and improving the uh, productivity and the yield of existing uh, agricultural techniques is critical, not just from a nutritional perspective, but also because it, it reduces the, uh, the need to cut down further forest, which tends to be tavi, uh, tavi farming, where they cut down the trees uh, on the hills, uh, the rainforest on the, on the hills, in order to make space for uh, additional rice paddy fields. Uh, we also have a big focus on and a, and a major focus on uh, on on um, on on gender uh, and really trying to ensure that females are not just participating but leading a lot of these initiatives. We've also been investing in infrastructure and teaching for three of, uh, as of now 13 existing stool, schools and uh, new schools uh, again at the request of the community and we've also impacted on the protection of various endangered species such as lemurs, aquatic tenrex and moose. Now, I don't actually know what a tenrec is, um, but I'm going to say it anyway, so I'm sure, uh, but that uh, that will be our, our conservation team who, who know more. Next slide, please. So the good news is that it does look like deforestation is reversing. Um, this again is another graph and another histogram from the Woodville Climate Research Center, which uh, which which analyzed uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, the carbon uh, the carbon moves. So from a conservation perspective, it appears that deforestation may actually be reversing. We see that here across uh, across the, for the all of the forest areas where there's a consistent deforestation from 2003 through to 2017. But we're also seeing signs of regeneration from 2018 up to 2020. We don't have the data from 20 onwards um, yet. And the red, arrow, the red arrow is where Health and Harmony started activities in, in 2018. Next slide, please. But it's complicated. Um, when we go more granular, we see that areas bordering where health and harmony support are have a have a positive have positive balances of annual change, but areas marginally outside that area of work do not. This suggests that we need to rapidly expand and to ensure that nearby nearby communities have access to the support. On this particular graph, we're working we're working on or where it says in the northern northeastern side. But just a little bit further away in the lower northern side, the northwestern, uh, lower northern side, we see how um, uh, the, the amount of logging has continues to uh, increase. Next slide, please. Another area we're working, of course, is Brazil. Uh, next slide, please. This is primarily in the state of Para, uh, in the uh, in the in the Amazonia. Next slide, please. Um, and this is uh, and here. Uh, we've uh, we've protected around about eight and a half million hectares of rainforest using uh, through the through the presence of the rainforest communities, 
access to healthcare here is extremely difficult. Uh, we're talking about two days, three days by boat to get to the nearest healthcare facility in Altamira. Um, and so we, we, we tend to conduct, conduct uh, mobile medical expeditions and reach these communities uh, through boats and sending doctors and nurses uh, from there. We also support market access for non-timber forest products. Um, we've generated around about close to $400,000 in annual revenues um, across the five indigenous and three uh, riverine lands. Protection-wise, we've helped protect over 100 mammal and 500 bird species, including areas which are critical habitats for white-lipped pe white peccaries, um, jaguars and tapirs. Next slide, please. Another component that we've been working on is how to redefine how we measure impact. Now, we've long felt that existing means of evaluation are based on extract extractivist colonial relations, and they don't really reflect the communities for whom they for whom these interventions are meant to benefit. It doesn't really matter to the communities what a lot of these indicators that donors typically ask for are. It matters to the implementers, but really not to the communities. So we've been trying to develop a, a different approach. Now, this is just to be clear, this is nothing new for IPLCs who have long established ways of measuring their own well-being. But we're trying to integrate this into our own program design. This is in, this is focused on an indigenous evaluation, um, which grounds data collection and cultural knowledge and value systems. And it arises from an understanding of strengths rather than deficits and uses data for the well-being of the community. So this Community Thrive in Thriving Index, um, we're trying to collaboratively, co collaboratively develop this tool with rainforest communities so that they can um, evaluate their own thriving on their own terms. Um, and we, we feel strongly that this the methods and the governance of this uh, evaluation technique needs to be determined and designed uh, by the participating communities. So this is another element of, uh, of the work that we're doing to kind of complete the whole uh, the whole picture. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the research that we're doing, um, because Health and Harmony, although you know we we are a implementation organisation, we do carry quite a strong dossier of research. Um, why do we do that? Primarily, we look at implementation operational research. How do we operationalise planetary health? Uh, how can we develop tools, validate these tools, and to demonstrate to others that they, these can be potentially good solutions for them to consider? But at the same time, we look at the downstream downstream outcomes. We've all, you know, we're all fresh at the heels of COVID, um, and this is, you know, primarily a result of a spillover. So this is something that we're that, that we've been really focusing on, recognizing the the potential impact on the work that we're doing. Like, I don't think I need to talk too much about One Health. To I think many people here will know what they, that is, but it essentially describes the inter interdependence of ecosystems, animals, and human well-being. And preventing the next pandemic rather than responding to it would save millions of lives and trillions of dollars and stop us being locked up for the last two, two to three years. Um, but very few studies have actually attempted to evaluate the causal relationship between forest conservation and interventions and spillover risk. And this is what we're trying to do as, a, as part of our work with Harvard, um, University of Chicago, Zoo New England and uh, Central Bar Bio. Um, now, working with these institutions, we're trying to see how community designed health, livelihoods and conservation interventions can potentially reduce the risk of virus spillover from animals into humans. Um, next slide, please. At the, same, uh, at the same time, we're also testing different methods of measuring and monitoring biodiversity so this can be done at scale. We recognise that the, you know, our little our little uh, intervention in, in Manumbu in, in Madagascar is not something that can be necessarily replicated in its existing format with the existing amount of resources that sorry, we're putting into it across the world. And so we're trying to see how we can develop and fine tune these tools um, that we're using uh, at scale. And in doing so, we're testing different methods of uh, measuring and monitoring biodiversity. We're currently looking at environmental DNA as a potentially easy implementation solution to monitor how wildlife is impacted uh, longitudinally over time. Next slide, please. And then to, again, to touch upon the spillover risk of zoonotic infectious diseases, this is another another one of those wonderful Woodwell maps. And again, this is a composite uh, where we see a, um, a, a the risk of emergence of zoonotic diseases created by analysing past reports, events, population, land use and species richness. Uh, and it's classified by percentile rank. And, and again, as we see the areas that we're working, uh, they, they tend to be re relatively high, uh, uh, high risk for, for spillover. So 
again, a, a, another justification and reason for us to, to be working here. Next slide, please. And what is our theory with regards to spillover? Um, the community design solutions results in for forest regeneration. We increase that buffer between humans and um, and uh, the forest and wildlife. Animals are, are happier. They reduce their pathogen load. They reduce their viral shedding simply down to the reduction in, in human contact. They thrive. Uh, and as a result, humans thrive. We have reduced, uh, we, th we, we, we think there'll be reduced respiratory disease, diarrheal disease, vector-borne disease, and uh, an, an overall a reduction in uh, risk of spillover. Next slide, please. We've also been looking at how can we stress test our model. COVID-19 presented us with a, with a unique um, position and a unique situation where we could see Within the communities that we've been supporting in Borneo, for example, how does how do they cope under stress, uh, huge economic stresses, such as the one that COVID uh, created, where people were unable to conduct their livelihoods, unable to travel, unable to access healthcare appropriately? Would that result in the fracture of the uh, the outcomes that we that we that I previously described with regards to the impact on deforestation and access to healthcare. So we worked together with Stanford um, and uh, University in, uh, in, in Indonesia and Plant Indonesia, another NGO, to kind of understand what the impact of these community designed livelihood health and conservation interventions on the resilience of rainforest communities um, in, during the COVID-19 uh, epidemic. Next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> and what we found actually was, was very positive. Although we knew that beforehand the average percent of forest la uh, loss per desa per, per, per village was uh, was was lower in our in the in the communities that uh, Health and Harmony was and Plant, Plant, Plant Indonesia were working with. Um, what we found is that they still continue to remain low, and they didn't increase during the pandemic. And household. Um, uh, a household survey showed that supported communities were three to six times less likely to resort to unsustainable jobs during the pandemic, yet they still had more material resources during the pandemic. So essentially, our model held true um, that uh, uh, during during COVID, and that was that was very reassuring for, for us to see. Next slide, please. We're also looking at some other different solutions, perhaps more for the medics here and the uh, um, and the parasitologists. But for example, we we see. We, we, and with this, with these questions, we're trying to again focus on the interlinkage between livelihoods, conservation, and health. One of the things that we see is that um, up to 50% of children test positive for Schistosoma mansoni in uh, in Manubis, in the special reserve in in, in southeast uh, Madagascar. And we, we we ask the question: Can we can nature-based solutions sustainably reduce the morbidity associated with this? Existing solutions are essentially just throwing molluscicides everywhere, which are horribly contaminating, um, but also and also using uh, uh, intermittent mass drug administration, which effectively doesn't really work in, in very high endemic uh, um, areas, sustainably anyway. We, we know, well, we think that the sources of the the, uh, the, the sales and the location of the sales and the, and the, and the point contact between humans and the, uh, and, the, and the schistosoma is in the rice paddy fields. So what kind of solution do we think about? We think about can we introduce endemic freshwater prawns to reduce the snail burden? And this could also potentially be a source of protein for communities and potential livelihoods. So this is this is an approach. It's a it's something that we're building up, working together with um, uh, with the LSHTM and the University of Glasgow to put in a to put in a, a strong proposal for this. Next slide, please. And we have similar questions about malaria. Um, it's, Malaria is the biggest cause of morbidity and mortality, you know, and we see huge amounts in the uh, in the community that we work with. It accounts for about seventy percent of our consultations, and seventy percent of those uh, of patients who presented with fever who are tested for malaria are positive. It's also home to a real uh, terror of a, a mosquito, Anopheles fenestus, which is a hyperbiter, which is quite specific in particular parts of the world, and, and Madagascar is one of them. And we think the right likely source of the rice paddy fields. Um, food insecurity also drives deforestation and tabby farming, as I previously mentioned. So what we're trying as part of our training support that we provide to the communities, we 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 we, uh, we use system rice in test in test systems rice intensification. Um, but we don't know what the impact of that will be on mosquito abundance.
So can we also introduce nature based solutions to improve yield, but also reduce malaria? What things could this be? Modif mod modified irrigation techniques, alternative wetting and drying, use of uh, Azula, that's a mosquito firm that covers the, uh, the surface of the uh, of the water and prevents the lava from, um, uh, from, from uh, growing. And also things like introducing tilapia fish as a biological control and again, another potential source of protein, recognizing that these communities are massively protein deficient. Next slide, please. So just coming to the end now, this is the, uh, the uh, a couple of slides left, but you know, one of the things that Constance asked me to talk about was what, what's needed from donors and stakeholders. For planetary health, it's a long term vision. Um, funding streams are inherently problematic. Grant cycles are short, you know, two to three years. Sometimes it's even nine months, even though they mention that climate change, planetary health approaches are part of the remit and they're, they're interested in this. It's not really realistic to deliver or demonstrate impact in, in a, uh, over a period of less than five years. So this is this is an important thing for people, for, uh, for donors and all stakeholders alike to, to, to consider. We also and I hope this comes through in the in the presentations I've made so far, is that to deal with the climate crisis, all of our stakeholders need to consider close, close cross discipline relationships. It's not conservation, it's not health, it's not livelihoods. Everything come, needs to come together, and we need to start thinking about holistic holistic solutions and overlapping and dealing with overlapping challenges and integrating these solutions across these different silos. We also need to move beyond the conceptual response to planetary health. You know, there's a lot of stuff in the literature about planetary health, a lot of ideas, a lot of amazing people working on, on how we can perceptualize uh, the idea and bring this together. But there's very little work going on in the actual implementation. And I think this is this is something that health and harm is. It's, it's the strength of health and harm is, and it's where we're trying to work. Um, we also need to design context appropriate interventions, recognizing that, you know, re introducing uh, ethanol uh, or uh, in ethanol uh, supplemented fuel in, in, in the US uh, will have an impact on the uh, on, for example, uh, deforestation in, uh, in Borneo and, and in Brazil. So these are the thinking about that, but also recognizing that every context, is, every context is different. And as I mentioned before, with the example I gave about nutrition, going in with a top down this is how it works approach just doesn't work and we know it doesn't work we've been doing this over and over again over the last few decades um so really learning from the communities that we're working with and following their guide and giving them the putting them in the driver's seat and knowing and recognizing that they are the experts not us is going to be key in success uh, over, over this decisive decade and uh next slide please and that's it uh Thank you very much for uh, your attention and my apologies about the first hiccup on the uh, on the teams, but uh, we, we finally got there. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. I see a number of clapping hands. Thank you so much, Saki. That was a tour de force um, and uh, thanks for keeping to the time. So we have a couple of minutes to exchange. But first of all, um, a great, uh, great presentation and chapeau to giving us the whole the whole round from the the causes and the logic and the argument all the way to the very concrete interventions and the research that you're doing to put evidence to the argument as well. So let me, without further ado, look right into the um, see. I have one hand and I saw Christina Romanelli's hand up earlier. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> but now I, I'll give the floor to Alice. Um, please go ahead and then Christina. Um, thank you. Fascinating talk. Uh, something that I was curious in with your work is if you ever factor the temporal elements into the analysis, because both in terms of the degree of species stress, various demographic factors are going to impact on the probability of spillover, but also the amount of resources available in the interactions they have with the natural world are going to change not only over space, but also over time. So I wondered how your field teams were trying to incorporate those more demographic and temporal elements. Thank you. Um, no, good question. Uh, I, th I mean, I think we've the only time, well, the, as of now, the only real 
longitudinal time assessment we've done of note has been the PNAS paper in Indonesia in Borneo, and that's been over a 10 year period where I think a lot of those factors, at least we try to control for as much of those factors as possible. Um, as of now, what we I think we are trying to bring together as much high quality data collection as we can, not just from within the work that we're doing, but also taking into account the surrounding influence. Um, one of the key problems that we've had is try, how do you create a, a database or a, a let's say a data collection tool that's adapted for planetary health that allows us to collect information on reforestation, on health indicators, on livelihoods, on exchange mechanisms. Um, and this is something that we've, we've, we've previously honestly not been very good at. And it's something that we've now invested strongly in over the next, uh, over the last year or so with uh, developing a, a, a comprehensive ComCare data collection tool, uh, which I hope will be useful for not just us, for others who also are trying to look at these more um, kind of transversal approaches uh, and bring together some of these different controlling elements that you that you mentioned. I don't know if that answers your question at all. Yep, that's useful. As you say, it's it's very complex. And I think that this is an area that's probably going to see more development and growth than any other. And um, I mean, Rainer Plyright's relatively recent paper looking at the intersection of uh, habitat stresses and seasonal demographics in bats and the probability of Hendra spillover is a really nice example of the need to understand how these different elements interact if we're really going to have a comprehensive understanding of what spillover risk looks like. Yep. Thanks agree. for raising that. Okay, shall we move on? Uh, Christina, and, and sorry, I wanted to say that to Alice as well. Why don't you briefly turn on the camera because it's always nicer to have a conversation seeing the faces. Um, Christina, over to you. Hi, Alice, <laughs> that's good. Um, thank you so much for that for that presentation, uh, Sakib. It was terrific. I'm, I've been a really long time fan of the work that Health in Harmony is doing and I learn something every time and I'm inspired every time I hear uh, about the work that you're doing. And the question, I mean, there was a question that I had on integrated indicators and, and how this can help to in, inform the development of integrated indicators. But fundamentally, the question that I always have when I hear about the amazing work that you're doing is you had mentioned very briefly that there were some stumbling blocks in some instances to scaling up because it's very context specific, which I can fully understand. But at large, <clears throat> like what what is it that what is the major stumbling block to scaling up this kind of model? Um, and you know, we I think this is the the kind of model we should be applying everywhere. So could you provide some insight on on that because it's it's got to be done. <laughs> well, it's 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 a million dollar question, right? Well, in fact, it's the it's the, it's a world crisis, uh, climate crisis question. I mean, um, for me, I think the the biggest challenge I've seen, uh, and again, I'm relatively new in this field. Um, I've been working with Health and Harmony for the last year or so, but looking about my experiences over the last twenty years in working in a lot of these countries that we that that, that fit within the Woodwell mapping is that organizations have a very siloed approach. It's very difficult for a conservation organization to think about, okay, what about health? What about livelihoods? What about all the other different factors? And, and actually when you, when you approach communities and if you ask communities to design the solutions, they will naturally bring in these different elements into a systems-based approach rather than a sector-based approach. And we are afflicted by history of you know the way things have worked i know you, you you'll be well aware of this um about you know the, the health cluster approach and the nutrition cluster it doesn't work and if we the moment we start i think changing the paradigm of the way that these organizations look at the work that they're doing and see how they can bring in or at least include other components then I think we start moving in a direction that we need to be in. Uh, but that for me is probably the largest block. Uh, and I think part of the biggest contribution that we're, Health and Harmony is trying to demonstrate that, you know, how can you meaningfully operationalize planetary health? Yes, on paper, in theory, it's a very good concept. We're all on board with it. Everybody agrees. But what does it mean to 
to actually roll it out and how can you collect that data how can you collect these tools and provide that evidence to others to say look here is a model it may or may not work for you but at least it's an option for you to consider and expanding something as simple as your deliverables i'm a healthcare organization i'm working in the congo perhaps one of my expected results on my log frame could be the impact of on deforestation Perhaps it could be supporting a more naturalistic nature based solution to a particular disease that involved that has an indicator that also includes conservation or forest reduction or improved livelihoods or so, things like that. Um, I think that that way of thinking needs to become more and more prevalent. Thank you, Sakib, for that answer. And also thanks for the question, Christina, because I indeed had the same question, <laughs> very same question. And I just adding, complimenting Sakib, your comment, I think. It, the same is true not only for the siloed approach, but for the, the funding streams and the funding tickets are always price tags with a with a topic usually on uh, or or an, even an indicator or even an output indicator. And if you if you know that ahead of time and don't go into these conversations with an open mind, including all in a systemic approach, then it's sometimes difficult to allow for that. That's just you know my observation from 20 years GTZ, GIZ work. Uh, so I think at that end, we, we have to do some work of awareness raising. But back to the questions and the raised hands. Yes, Ute, go ahead. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, talk and the interesting approach as well. Um, I have two short questions. Um, I would like to have some examples of the indicators um, the local communities developed in which context they were different than uh, so-called Western indicators. That was one question. The other question was, uh, you said everybody can grow seedlings, but traditionally men own the land. Um, so I would be inter uh, interested to know if you really checked if as much women turn up uh, uh, to get some health care with seedlings than men do. Sure, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer the uh, the second one first because it's the easiest one to answer. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, I mean, the vast majority of the patients that we see in the clinics are female. I mean, this is normal in all health programs. Uh, you know, women and children make up 70 to 80 80 percent of the the through for, the through flow of uh, of uh, uh, services in health, uh, and that's what we see. So yeah, absolutely, they they take their. Um, uh, they, they bring the seedlings, they also the eco poly bags, little, not just seedlings, but also using, um, uh, they can weave using natural kind of leaves to create these little bags that you plant, that put the seedlings in. So this is very common for us and it's not an issue. The question of the men owning the land, it's a good question. I can't answer that um, comprehensively or because I, the answer is I don't know. Uh, my, my, but from what I've seen from my visits, is that there isn't an issue of growing seedlings on land or land ownership in that respect. Um, but I can, you know, I'll, I'll get back to you that if, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, if that is indeed a, uh, an issue that we, that our conservation team have, have faced. In answer to the first question about the thriving index, we're, for, we're very much in the early stages of this. Um, as I mentioned before, kind of what community, indigenous populations have long already determined and defined their own indices of, of well-being. Um, it's not, bon, I think, Bon Vivre in, uh, in, um, in, in the Amazon, in, in, in other places as well. So we're not, we discover, we're not redesigning the wheel. You know, we've not made some amazing discovery here. This is very much, us, again, learning from the communities who are the experts. How are they different um, and how do we expect them to be different? We are starting now to do the kind of to do the research on with the communities to identify these thematics that they're bringing forward. So probably in about six months time, I'll be able to give you a much clearer answer on that once we've done these assessments. But my, at least my, 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 my sense is that they're going to be less focused on, for example, um, specific health indicators like, you know, the number of children uh, who have got a MOAC of less than 115 and more on how happy am I, how happy are my children? And one, one uh, example that uh, our founder, Kinnery Webb, always does mention is about how one community said, look, we, I know that my, my, my children are happy and healthy when they sing to the cows. I'm not saying that that's going to be an indicator, but it's an example of how far away from the classic type of indicators that we use as, uh, as professionals 
can be from what what how the communities that we serve perceive well-being well we do know that the cows produce better when they are sung too so that's <laughs> a double benefit <laughs> thank you very much please well come back to me in six months <laughs> yeah, definitely. thanks excellent question any further questions any comments or observations from your own work to bring in here if not at the moment i'll i'll jump in no kim go ahead yes thank you very much Saki, for this really excellent and inspiring presentation we're also a big fan of your work um what i'm interested in is if you could possibly because we're the international alliance against health risks and wildlife trade maybe uh, you know as we most of us probably know um, deforestation often goes alongside with an increase in, in wildlife extraction and and trade and um, if you could maybe as far as you want to or can elaborate also maybe a little bit about the trade the extraction the consumption and the trade that does come or can also be reduced or maybe how much you have considered that in in, in your work no thank you Thank you, Kim. Super, super good question. Um, so I think it's it's uh, for us, it's very important uh, and it's something that we consider a lot, uh, not just from a conservation perspective, but as, as I mentioned before, from the, from the spillover perspective, we know that if we increase rainforest, we separate humans from the forest, keep those healthy buffers there. Um, not only does extra extraction reduce, uh, but consequentially, the, the risk of spillover uh, reduces as well. If I take Madagascar as an example, we know that lemurs um, are a potential source of protein. It's also illegal to hunt lemurs. Um, uh, and to ask, we know it. We know that it happens, but communities tend to be quite reticent to discuss it. Um, but what we know is that if we provide alternative sources of protein, these could be fish. We're looking at other things like cricket powder, uh, for example. Um, Crickets are the, the actual crickets that uh, they get crushed and um, they're found by the communities within the communities working with NBC on this. Um, if they have access to alternative sources of both income and protein, they no longer need to extract, for at least for consumption. Um, for trade, I can't talk too much on it because honestly, I don't know. I've not seen that or heard of that being discussed as an issue within our um, within our context, but I'm absolutely sure it is a it is an issue elsewhere. But I guess the same logic would apply, right? If you if you are you know these communities, they it's not that we need to tell them what you're doing is bad. No, they they will be the one. They're the ones who are teaching us what's good and what's bad. But they have their own pressures that force them to do this, to, to, do, to, do, to engage in trade, to engage in consumption of, of wildlife. And if we're able to provide those livelihood and those healthcare supports and identify, and well, once they've identified the drivers of, of them doing this, once we're able to address those solutions that are designed by the communities, we automatically will reduce this as a problem. So I hope that kind of answers it. Yes, thank, thank you very you. much. And I have two more hands uh raised here barbara please go ahead hi sakib and thank you and you and your team for the amazing work you're doing and it's the first time i've heard about it and it's really inspiring thank you now i have um, a question for you um we talk a lot and hear a lot about this care by local communities uh, for the biodiversity uh, and the forests um, in how far do you think this is a dilution effect by low population density rather than an effect of specific knowledge? Can you, can you the, first, the first line, I, 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 you broke up a little bit. Sorry. On the, yes. I'm sorry. Um, obviously, local communities population density is very low compared yeah. to population density elsewhere. So my question is, in how far do you believe that this and that a lot of what we're seeing about the care that local communities exert on their uh, environment is a result of dilution effect, of a dilution okay. and low population density rather than some kind of magic dust that uh, communities have to tackle environmental problems. Yeah, okay. 
Okay. Okay. I think it's it's a really important question, actually, and it's a really relevant question as well, not just for the work that we're doing, but also from a donor perspective, which I, may, I maybe mentioned a little bit about. Um, if I give if I give the example of the Amazon rainforest as an example, there we have out of all the populations that we work with, they are by far the least dense. They are it's extremely sporadic. Um, so you have these huge areas and you have essentially two groups of populations, the riverine populations who live along the river, the riverside who've been there for the last maybe 100 years. And then you've got the indigenous tribal populations who are scattered in and around the forest areas. But when you're looking at population densities, you're, you're talking about, you know, eight million hectares being protected by maybe seven thousand people, eight thousand people. Yeah. Now. Why do we think they're protected? Well, we know they're protected because when the when these populations are present in these areas, the ex, the miners, the 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 the, the cattle herders, um, and the and the loggers, they they don't come in because they're they they know that it's illegal and they're afraid of the local populations retaliating against them. So in that respect, I think it, it even though it's low density, that impact is hugely important. And the same thing goes in Borneo as well. It's not that the population is, they have some sort of magic dust. Ultimately, those who do the chopping are those who live within the area. It's not that, it's not the case that we see people coming from outside to do the chopping. It's the people who are living within who chop down, start keeping the government contracts aside. But from a day-to-day -day basis, it's a, it's a local populations who tend to be most responsible for the logging for, the, for various reasons. But the population density is also important for another reason. And I'll give you a, an example is when we see humanitarian climate shocks. A typical response for a for donors, let's say, to a climate shock in Madagascar is to focus on the cities, the populations with the highest density, where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to human contact. Now, the, the counter counter side of that is that the areas, the populations who live within the forest areas, the rainforest areas tend to be very low density. So they don't get a look in at all. Now, the irony of this is that the po these populations, once they've had all their buildings wiped out and they have no source of alternative support, where are they likely to get their wood from? If it was you and you didn't have a, you know, you've got four children, you have no family, you have got no house, it's been blown away, it's been washed away, inevitably, and you live next to a forest, inevitably you're going to extract. The same thing if you have no food. Now, the result of that is that we, you know, Hypothetically, what we're going to see is a, is, is a further reduction and an extraction of wildlife, but also reduction, a redu an increase in deforestation because these patients, these populations, even though they're not dense, they don't have that support. And to provide that support to these populations would be so low cost and the impact would be so high when it comes to protecting and also preventing further climate change. It's a shame that it's not considered. And I think this is where, you know, when I talk about the different kind of integrating different thoughts and different approaches, for different health, for different kind of actors, for, stakes, for stakeholders with specific focuses, to think a little bit outside the box and always take the concept of climate change and and conservation into whatever we're doing, will have a huge impact and and deliver and deliver in, in a major way. Thank you. No, my pleasure. And I have one more hand, Alexander. Please go ahead, and if we can keep it short so that we end the session on time more or less with a minute or two. Please go ahead. OK, Constance, I will try to. Sakim, fantastic. I absolutely agree with you. Um, I was lucky to also work uh, some 10 years in Madagascar. Yeah. And um, I worked uh, now uh, 20 years with WHO in environmental health area. So it is clear. The, uh, I, I would call it the participatory approaches. The vertical approach is, is the only one that actually creates ownership and, and that is a little guarantee for sustainability. Now, in my um, listening to you, I'm, I'm uh, wanting to ask, uh, often it is not only the donors that have their own approach, it is very much also the local authorities, like yeah. ministries and uh, authorities, yes, in general, who maybe um, would benefit you know, from understanding all these very complex issues that you are pre, uh, bringing here to the, fr to the front. Uh, what would you suggest could be uh, a way to, to come forward towards these, uh, these authorities that are very often uh, horizontally uh, you know, uh, established? 
in order to not only get them on board, but also in order to institutionalize this approach with a little more, you know, uh, luck than just having it uh, something happening between uh, an external, uh, uh, say, uh, development agency, yeah. like that, and the local community. So, what what would you suggest we we could do there? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alexander. I mean, it's it's a it's a fantastic question, but it's also a very difficult question. Um, I mean, for us, I think we we first of all we emphasise on making sure that a hundred well, a hundred percent of our our staff in country uh, are all the co programs are managed by nationals by nationals for nationals. I think that does have an impact on on the on the way that it's received by local by or by the authorities at the regional level. We have a lot more pull. And we have a lot more influence because we they see what we're doing. We have struggled to translate that to the national level. And I think that's partly because we are still quite young as an organization and our approach is still quite young, especially in, in Madagascar and Brazil. So I know we you know we are one of our keys for scale over the next 10 years is advocacy and trying to determine how we engage with national bodies to say, look, there has to be a different a differential approach to the way that health the ministry of health is working separate to the ministry of the environment and so on and so on and to try and bring that together is going to be key i think the production of good quality evidence is is, is crucial here because you know what they and if, and if i was a minister in a country and i had some ragtag organization coming to me saying look we've done this it sounds really cool i'm always going to ask show me the impact show me the economic model that that supports it um, yes, I know that th th the forests are important, but how 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 is what you're doing replicable across you know even different regions of my country? So I think being able to have develop that level of detail and nuance and discourse um, at the national level is going to be crucial in this. And I think with time, I think with support of people on this the, the groups on this call, and I think the work that you're doing with the WHO that opening up our, our thinking to, to include the different the different lines of approach will be crucial in this. The more organizations that come to the government, you know, the more MSFs, the more UNICEFs, the more HIHs, the more, um, you know, the, the more CARES who come to the government at the national level when they're sitting at these cluster meetings and talk about conservation and talk about these different participatory models being integral of what they're doing that will lead to a greater buy-in at the national level as well because at the moment so few are doing it it's unlikely to have any pull we're, we're a tiny fish in a big ocean okay thank you so much Sakib. with that uh tiny fish in a big ocean <laughs> i think we'll leave it at that for today but thank you so much for uh, dedicating your time not only now for these 75 minutes, but also obviously the time that you and the whole team, uh, Nina and everybody else at uh, Health and Harmony dedicates to this important approach. And let me take you up on that, uh, what you said earlier, that in six months time you would like to come back. I think it uh, would be really nice, whether it's in six months or in eight months time, to invite you back and give us some info and input on the Community Thriving Index and your first assessment on that, and then maybe see where this uh, advocacy and, and um, reaching out to national governments. Maybe we can invite one or two from national governments uh, where you work in and just continue this conversation in terms of getting out of those silos and looking at things systemically between livelihoods, conservation and health. I think it's very important and, and excellent work. Thank you so much. And thank you to all who are attending. As always, we'll put this uh, video on our website and we'll share that with you. And please uh, keep in touch if you have any questions, any comments or remarks. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon and evening.